And our subject that we're going to be studying this afternoon or this morning is going to be our need for victory over sin. Our need for victory over sin. And we're going to be talking about that from none other than the authoritative word of God. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. Amen. As long as you believe the Bible, you will find this to be a very, very, very comfortable place. Because we are going to speak the word and not man's thoughts. And you're going to find that God has a beautiful message for us today. And I'm excited about giving it, but I believe that ministers need to be equipped to give God's word. And the best way to do that is on our knees. So I'm going to kneel to pray at this time. And if you'd like to, you can join with me and you can kneel. And if you can't kneel, just bow your heads where you are. But let's all pray together as we prepare our hearts to receive the message of the hour. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege to come together as a family to study your words. And Lord, we just simply want to hear the voice of Jesus. We are grateful that you still speak to humanity. The key means by which you do it is through your holy word, the Bible. And Lord, while so many in the world and even in the church is losing confidence in this holy book, I pray, please do something special today. Increase our faith. Help us, Lord, to understand your words of truth. And I pray that you will do for us what we never could have accomplished for ourselves. And may you get all the credit. Lord, I ask you to please take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Speak to my mind and speak through my mouth that I may minister to the heart needs of my brothers and my sisters. And I thank you that you have heard this prayer, but also that you have answered it. For we ask it in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe in such a time as this in Earth's history that a very important passage of Scripture is not only being fulfilled, but is coming to the close of its fulfillment. It is found in none other than the book of Daniel, the eighth chapter. It is in Daniel, the eighth chapter, that the Bible presents a prophecy which happens to be the longest and the last prophecy based on time in Scripture. And it is found in Daniel, the eighth chapter, and it is in the 14th verse, and many of us may know it by memory, some of us, we may have to turn there. In either case, the Bible clearly says in Daniel 8 and verse 14, it says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, and then something special was going to happen. It says, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed cleansed, we need to understand what the cleansing of the sanctuary actually means. And for that, I'm going to ask us to turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus, the 16th chapter, and I want you to see what the text says because we need to understand what does it mean when the Bible prophesies of a time where there's going to be a cleansing of the sanctuary. We need to understand what that means. And the Bible says it very clearly in the book of Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And when you get there, I'm going to ask you to please let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Leviticus 16, and we're going to consider verses 16 to 19. That's where we're going to begin. This is none other than what's called the Day of Atonement or at one -ment. And on this Day of Atonement, there was a work that the high priest was to do in the sanctuary, but not just the sanctuary general, but specifically in the most holy place. Of the sanctuary. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus chapter 16 starting at verse 16. If we're there please say amen. The Bible says in Leviticus 16 16 and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 17 and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and do what? 
and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. According to what we just read, what is being cleansed? I heard a few. What is it that's being cleansed according to what we just read? It's the sanctuary. The sanctuary is being cleansed. He's going to different parts and he's put, applying blood because 1 John 1 and verse 7 says, the blood of Christ cleanses away all sin. So the blood being applied is a cleansing process. So here it is that he's cleansing the sanctuary. That's why it's saying cleanse it, cleanse it, cleanse it. It's an object. It's the sanctuary. But now go to verse 30. When you go to verse 30, notice what else it says. In Leviticus 16, now we're looking at verse 30. The Bible goes on to say in Leviticus 16 and verse 30, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for who? For you, that he may do what? That he may cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. What's being cleansed in verse 30? The people. So verses 16 to 19, what's being cleansed? The sanctuary. In verse 30, what's being cleansed? The people. Now, here's my question. According to the verses, which one needs to be cleansed first? The sanctuary or the people? Which one? Okay, you sound like the mixed multitude. Because some are saying people, some are saying sanctuary. So which one is it? Which one is it? In order for the sanctuary to truly be cleansed, which one is it that needs to be cleansed first, the sanctuary or the people? It's the people. You see, if you saw verse 16, why did the sanctuary get dirty in the first place? It was because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So if God is ever going to have a clean sanctuary, he must first have a what? Clean people. Now, why is that important? Because go to the book of Hebrews 8. Let's go ahead. Let's make this thing. Let's, let, let's stop talking past truth. Let's talk present truth. So let's notice this. Now we're going to the book of Hebrews, the eighth chapter. When we look at Hebrews, the eighth chapter, the Bible tells us a very, very important principle. And I want you to see it because this principle we studied thus far, it affects us today. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we're looking at the eighth chapter. And let's notice what the Bible says as we consider Hebrews 8, 1 to 5. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verses 1 to 5, if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 8, starting at verse 1, now, of these things which have spoken, we have spoken, this is the sum. We are such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So notice, this is not talking about something on earth anymore. Because man pitched the sanctuary on earth. Man built that. But now it's talking about a sanctuary, but it's not on earth. It's someplace else. So let's continue. It says, verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there, is, there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of what kind of things? heavenly things now watch this who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as moses was admonished of god when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mountain so according to the bible the earthly tabernacle or the earthly sanctuary was none other than a picture of what actually was going to be happening in the reality, the true tabernacle, a heavenly sanctuary. The Bible teaches that Jesus is in a place right now, and it's called the most holy place, not of the earthly, but of the heavenly sanctuary. And the great work that Christ has been seeking to accomplish for many a years is, in fact, the fulfillment of that prophecy in Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But the problem is, you can't have a clean sanctuary until you first have a clean what? People. So until the people are clean, can we go to heaven? So now don't ask, why are we still on earth? 
We often wonder, why is it that Jesus hasn't come? Listen, you don't think Jesus wants to come? My brothers and my sisters, G more, I don't care how much you and I long for heaven, magnify it times infinity, and that's how much God wants you in heaven. But the problem is, is that God in certain ways is very much like us. If somebody came to your house and said, hello, I know you don't know me, but I am, I am deceitful above all things, and I am a desperately wicked man. Can I please come in your house? How many of you would let that man in your house? Not one of you would be foolish enough to let a man in your house when he admits, I am deceitful above all things and I'm a desperately wicked man. Please let me inside your house. We would never let a man inside of our house unless something's wrong with us. God is the same. God says the natural condition of the human heart is that we are deceitful. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's how God describes our hearts. And as a result of that, why would God let a heart like that in his house? So God says before anybody's going to come in my house, we need to have the experience creating me a clean heart. You get that? So the great work, the great focus of heaven is that God wants to cleanse us not from some and not from most. He needs to cleanse us from every single one of our sins. Somebody says, but wait a minute. Do you mean to tell me every one? Do, are you telling me that I need to get victory over every sin? First of all, some people question, is that even possible? Then the second question is, if it is possible, how? Can one cherished Sin actually keep a man or a woman from heaven? Somebody says, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure. Yes and no. But I'll tell you what. How about we get rid of all of the guessing and let's find out what the word says. Go to the book of Mark, the 10th chapter. Can one cherished sin actually keep an individual out of the kingdom? Notice what the Bible says. In Mark, let's go to the book of the 10th chapter. Mark, we're going to chapter 10. And we're going to look carefully at that story of the rich young ruler. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 10. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus. His desire is actually eternal life. I am so thankful for that. Even rich people can desire to get to heaven. Amen? Sometimes people say rich people are a bunch of worldly, nasty beings that just love devilish behavior. That's not true. This man was rich. And he wanted eternal life. He didn't understand the cost, but he wanted it. He was genuine. He was very sincere. Now watch the story. In Mark, the 10th chapter, what does the Bible say? The Bible says in Mark, chapter 10, we're going to go ahead and start right there at verse 17. The Bible says in Mark 10, verse 17. If we're there, please say amen. All right. The Bible says in Mark 10, and verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. Oh, that's, that's nice when you see people running to find out how to be saved. It says, it came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And then verse 20, and he answered and said unto him, master, all these have I observed from my youth. He thought he was all right when he was all wrong. We just talked about that. And here it is, Jesus had to sober him up. And I want you to watch what Jesus says. He goes ahead and he says unto this man, now that we're looking at verse 21, then Jesus beholding him, loved him and said unto him, how many things? How many things? One thing. I want you to catch that, don't lose that. That was put in the Bible on purpose. How many things? One thing thou lackest. In other words, this brother was 99% good. But there was one thing that he was lacking. And the Bible goes on to say, one thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was happy. Is that what the verse says? The verse says, and he was sad. You see, a lot of people think they have their possessions, and many a times when it's time to part from it, we discover we never had our possessions. Our possessions had us. And that's what this brother found out. He found out my possessions have a control over me. 
And so the Bible goes on to say, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. That brother did not just lose, all, lose out on life temporal, he lost out on life eternal. But it was because of how many things? One thing, my brothers and my sisters, one sin cherished can neutralize the entire power of the gospel. It can neutralize the entire power of the gospel. And that's why when we study the sanctuary like we just did, we saw that in the cleansing process, did you catch what it said in verse 30? It said that they may be clean from how much? All their sins. In the mind of God, it's all or nothing. That's actually what he wants when we think about a relationship. You know, the world, the world and the churches love to talk about relationships with Jesus. And I often think to myself, I've been married now for 18 years. May 25th coming up next year, by God's grace, will make 19 years. And I am happy. Amen. Now watch this. When a man and a woman are in a marriage, I want you to imagine that a man decides to go ahead and cheat on his wife. Is that good or is that bad? Well, that's wicked. Now watch this. When a man decides to cheat on his wife and go ahead and commit adultery and mess around and do all this other stuff, I want you to think with me. If he leaves his home, goes with some other woman, goes around gallivanting and having what he calls fun while he leaves his bride and his children behind, that is a terrible scenario, wouldn't you agree? Now here it is that let's say one day he sobers up. And he sobers up and he realizes, you know what, I have made a mistake. I am a fool. I can't believe this. You know what, I have a wife at home and I have children. I need to go back and see if I can make my wrongs right. Well, that's a good step, wouldn't you agree? Amen. So here it is, the brother comes home and he says, honey, listen, I've been a fool. I have been an absolute fool. I can't believe what I've done. I have made horrible mistakes. Honey, can you please forgive me? Children, will you please forgive me? Now let's say the wife and children say yes and they forgive him. Let's say that happens. Would that be a good thing? All right. So then when the wife and children say, no problem, husband, no problem, daddy, we'll go ahead and everything will be okay. Well, let, imagine the father and husband then says this. So you forgive me? They say, yes, we forgive you. Then he says, great, I'll tell you what. The woman that I was committing adultery with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have her move back in the house with me. And what I'm going to do is four days a week, I'm going to spend it with you all. But three days a week, I'm going to spend it with her because I want to kind of wean her off the process, you know? I don't want to just cold turkey cut her off. So I'm going to just wean it off. Is that all right? How many of you would accept an arrangement like that? Would any of you accept an arrangement like that? Look at that. None of you. Not one hand went up. Okay, so what if he said, all right, I realized I was being overzealous. Um, maybe let's do this. How about I'll spend five days with you and just two days with the other party? How many of you would accept that arrangement? Wait, nobody would accept it? Not one? Okay, well, let's try it again. What if he said, okay, I'll give you six days and 21 hours of my time. I just want three hours with the other party so I could wean off of the relationship. How many of you would say, all right, well, that one, that's, that's pretty reasonable. I'll work with that. How many of you would work with that process? Look at that. Not one up the top of the bottom. Did you know not one of your hands went up? How many of you would say something like this to that spouse? Spouse, if there's any chance of us ever having a happy marriage and relationship, it has to be all or nothing. How many of us, if you're going to strive to work out the marriage, how many of us would have that attitude, all or nothing? Let me see. How many? All right, now look at that. That's the grand majority of you. Now here's my point. We can understand that in terms of an earthly marriage. In an earthly marriage, it has to be all or nothing. No playing around with the adulterer. It has to be a clean cutoff. Otherwise, the relationship is not going to work even when you give me the majority of your time. As long as you give that person a nanosecond, let alone anything else above it, this relationship will never work. It's amazing. Jesus says, so it is with me. Jesus says the same principle, you're governing your earthly marriage. Christ says it's the same thing with me. You see, there was a third party that came in the relationship between God and man. You see, the Bible tells us this. The Bible makes it very, very clear that there was sin. It says that your iniquities have done what? It's separated between you and your God. And then it says, and your sins have hid his 
face from you that he will not hear. You see, sin caused separation between man and God. Sin is what started to produce the concept of divorce. It was sin. Sin is the third party. And what's happening is there are a lot of men and a lot of women trying to walk in a successful relationship with Jesus with the third party in their lives. And they think they can have a successful relationship. Now, you just testified that on earth that would never work. Why do you think it would work in heaven? If it can't work on earth, then it can't work in heaven. God says, I want all or nothing. Sin is that third party, and some of us are trying to neg negotiate with God. All right, Lord, I realize that what I'm doing is wrong and it's sinful, so what I'll do is most of the days of the week, I'll go ahead and serve you, but I still want to have a few days or hours with my darling sin. And God says, that negotiation will never work. God says, I want all or nothing. You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And so God makes the same arrangement. So we need victory over sin if we're ever going to have a happy relationship with Jesus. If we are ever going to have a happy, successful, fulfilling, true relationship with Jesus Christ, we must get to the place that we love him more than sin. You see, that I want to let you know right now, do you know that the, the reason we sin is because we love it more than we love him. But Jesus gave a promise. Can I, can I show you? Go to the book of John, the 14th chapter. Let me show you something. Jesus gave a wonderful promise, and I'm so thankful for this promise. It gives me hope every single day. The Bible says in John, the 14th chapter, and I want you to see what the text says as we consider John 14 and verse 15. Jesus literally gives the formula for success when we think of victory over sin. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 15, he says, if you love me, what's going to be the fruit? Keep my commandments. What is sin? It is the breaking of God's commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. The reason we play and toy with sin so much is because we still have a love relationship with that thing. And the love we have for that is stronger than our love for God. Because Jesus said, if you really love me, if you love me as I called you to love me, Jesus says, when you see sin, you would shut it, you would abhor it, you would hate it. And you know what? I got a taste of that. You know why? You may not be aware of this, I don't know, but did you know that marriage was called to be a symbol of the relationship between Christ and his people? You read that in Ephesians 5 and verse 32. God gave marriage to teach us the relationship between Christ and the church. Now, when I was in the hip-hop world, player all day long. Player meaning messing around with more than one woman. But when God brought me out of that darkness into his marvelous light, and then he allowed me to meet my precious bride, then what I discovered is that love for my wife killed the player inside. You understand that? I'm satisfied. So now I'm not going around looking for who's next and this, that, and the other. And that's what love does. And there are a lot of marriages like that. Amen? We're not looking around for anybody else because we have found our satisfaction. Amen? Jesus says, it can happen with me. The same way that love can kill the player in a man is the same way that love for Jesus can kill the sinner in a man. Christ says it's possible, but it takes that thing called love. Now, the problem is, is that while he says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, let's notice what it says in verse 23. Same book, same chapter, John 14. Now we're looking at verse 23. The Bible goes on to say, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Another term for words is commandments. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Verse 24, he that loveth me, what? Not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You see, the reason we disobey is because we love him not. You understand that? That's what Jesus just said. Now, either he's a liar or he's telling the truth. What we have to accept 
is that every time sin comes in our face and we are privileged to have a choice, choose righteousness and maybe even suffer and lose, or choose the pleasure of sin and break the heart of God. We always have a choice in front of us. And every time it's in front of us and we say, I just want that sin, just got to do it once. We're testifying that our love for Christ is thoroughly weak. It's brittle. It's fragile. And so what Jesus says is he says the way you get this thing called victory over sin is you must cultivate a love for me. The greater our love for Christ, we will not break his heart anymore. We will not hurt him. And you know what's so sad? When we sin, we think we're just hurting ourselves. But we don't understand we're hurting more than ourselves when we sin. Often, when, even when we sin, we're very selfish in our approach to it. We think that when we sin, oh man, we hurt ourselves. But let me show you what the Bible says. Go to Isaiah 63. When you go to Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, notice what the Bible says. You see, it's not just you and I that get hurt. Somebody else gets hurt. The Bible says in Isaiah the 63rd chapter. This is why we need victory over sin. Need it. It must take place by the grace of God. It says in Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, notice what it says as we consider verses 7 and 8. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, verses 7 and 8, if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, verse 7, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just do verses 8 and 9. 8 and 9, just for time. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their what? Savior. Now watch verse 9. In all their, the people, in all their affliction, who else was afflicted? Who is this he? This is God himself, our Savior. In all our affliction, who else was afflicted? It says Christ was afflicted. This is the concept of Hebrews 6 and verse 6, where it talks about when we renew our sins, we crucify the Son of God afresh. We renew the pain. You see, whenever we sin, it doesn't just bring us pain. It brings God pain. It causes him pain. And this is why I believe we need victory over sin, because victory over sin stops the pain, yours and God's. That's why I believe we need it. That's why God so desperately wants to give it, because we can get to a place that we don't have to keep hurting him anymore. And I thought about it. When I read this verse, every time we were afflicted, it says he was afflicted. That means every time we fall into sin and we go through our pain, it is as it were God is going through pain himself. He's hurting with us. Because when we sin, it doesn't just hurt us, it hurts him. And the same way if you and I were to go ahead and, and just walk down the street and you're walking down the street and a man comes up to you and just slaps you in your face, you would look at that man and say, why did you do that? I didn't do anything to you. But you know what? That scenario doesn't compare to Jesus. Because it's not that Jesus didn't do anything to us. Jesus did a lot to us. But Acts 10 and verse 38 says that he did nothing but good to us. So imagine Christ is doing nothing but good to us, but in return, we're slapping him in his face. Thanks, but no thanks. And then when we hurt him like that, we don't understand. While it brings God pain, while it brings you and I pain, it actually brings joy and satisfaction to somebody else. You see, we are told. In inspiration, it says, the what? Did you know the only satisfaction Satan takes in playing the game of life for the souls of men is the satisfaction he takes in hurting the heart of Christ? Do you know that Satan is not even happy when you and I fall into sin and suffer? He doesn't care as much about that. When Satan tempts us and we fall into his traps, it's as it were, he puts his foot over our back in triumph and looks Jesus right in the face and says, look what I've done to another one of these people you died for. Look at how they're saying thanks to you. They're following me. They're not following you. And he looks in the eyes of Christ and he says, look at what I've done. And this is his satisfaction. It's amazing. There's a lot more that takes place every time we choose to sin against God. Every time. There's a lot more that takes place. It's not just simply hurting us. It's hurting God, and it's pleasing Satan. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? This is why God had to have a solution. 
This is why God had to have a solution. You see, where, again, that, that wonderful text we looked at, 1 Corinthians 15, let's turn back there. You see, God had to have a solution. The question was, Lord, how can we get out of this deplorable state? How can we get to a place that we can finally have total, complete, absolute victory over sin? Well, God says it's not that it's not possible. God says you just need to understand the formula. And so it is, God begins by showing us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again, looking at that verse, in verse 57. Notice what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, it says, But thanks be to God, who, which giveth us the what? Victory through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through Jesus, we can have total, complete, absolute victory over every single sin. There is no, if, listen to me, saints, because it's funny. God's people, we can be pretty amazing. We can believe that God is so great, God is so powerful, but when we start talking about victory over sin, there are people who actually believe impossible. And in my mind, I'm saying, how in the world can we say that? Do you know when we say we cannot have victory over all sin, what we're really saying is Satan is more powerful than God. God is too weak to keep me from falling, and Satan is too strong to keep pulling me down. Come on, saints. I hope none of us would ever make such a declaration. God can give us victory. It comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, do you believe it? Because listen, your experience will go no further than what you believe. Even Jesus said to that man in Mark 9, when his son was sick and possessed with that demon, Jesus said unto him, do you believe I can do this? Because everything, anything is possible to him that believes. So when you find yourself in that place in which you're saying, Lord, I don't believe you can even give me victory over sin. I believe you can help me stop smoking, but I don't think you can help me stop having premarital sex. Brothers and sisters, what we need to do is say, Christ, please help thou my unbelief. Be honest with God. Lord, I actually don't believe you. You're right. But please help thou my unbelief. Did Jesus help that man? He did. Will he help you? Yes, he will. And so it is that Jesus says, I got a plan. And you know where the plan is found of how he's going to help us get victory over sin? The plan is found right there. Is in the sanctuary. You see, in the sanctuary, God did something special. You see, in Exodus 25 and verse 8, the Bible says, let them make me a sanctuary. He said, let them make me a sanctuary. But the reason why he said it was he said that I may dwell among them. In order to have this experience that we so desperately need, that it may stop the pain, God says, I want you to make a sanctuary. And there was something he had in mind. Here's what he had in mind. You see, when he said, let them make me a sanctuary, look at it, that I may dwell how? Among. But if you look in the Hebrew, it actually means in. So Jesus said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in them. Christ always wanted to be in us. And you know what I love about it? If you really look at it carefully, this is so sweet. When Jesus said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in them. According to the Bible, Jesus is not just a good prophet. He's God. Is that right? Amen. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus called himself Jehovah. He is God. Now watch this. 1 John 4 tells us something about God. It says in 1 John 4, right there in verse 8, God is love. So when Jesus says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in them. Let them make me a sanctuary because they're going to learn how I'm going to put my love in them. And when love is in us, then no matter how much temptation squeezes us, only love for Christ can come out of us. And it will be revealed in obedience, faith. We will die before we will break his heart. And so it is that Jesus says, in. In fact, this in you concept is actually all over the Bible. Look at this. Abide where? In me and I in you. Notice again, God wants to be in us. In us. Notice that. I want you to think about that. And when it says in us, we're talking about his mind. We're not talking about a ghost that's inside of us filling up our bodies. We're talking about his mindset. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus knows as a man thinks in his mind, so is he in his character. 
And so it is, Christ says, in you. So notice, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in them. Exodus 25, 8. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you. What happens when Jesus abides in us? He makes his home in our hearts. What is it that happens? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's why he wants to be in you, because he knows that if any man be in Christ, then the mind of Christ takes over, and now we can live the new life in Jesus Christ. And guess what? If Jesus is living out his life in us because he's abiding in us, I wonder what's the end result of Christ abiding in us. The Bible says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Mission accomplished. Do you get it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you see it? Jesus says the solution is in the sanctuary. Jesus says because in the sanctuary, my people, they will learn how I'm going to make my home in their heart. And that's why we have table of shoe bread, studying the word every day. Then we have candlesticks, living out the life of Christ and evangelism, sharing God's love and life of obedience every day. Then we see the incense, our prayers mingling with the righteous merits of Jesus that is able to empower us to have victory over every sin. Jesus says in the sanctuary, if you carefully study it, it reveals the formula for you and I. But this is the reason why, my friends, we have to get to a place that we study what is sin. Do we see that God wants to give us victory over sin? Amen? In fact, let me show it to you this way. Again, I remember one time I was at one place. I won't tell you where, but I was preaching at a church. Oh, the church was packed. And we were going over the word of God, and it was a blessing. And I remember that we got to a point where we're teaching victory over sin, how Jesus, through the righteousness of Christ, we can and must have victory over sin before probation closes. And I was showing them that. Now, here's the thing that happened. When we started going over that, <laughs> there was a gentleman, uh, you know, I'll just tell you, he was, he was the pastor of that church. He was there, and he was sitting. And I noticed he was sitting in a very inviting posture. He was, he was sitting in a posture where he was demonstrating that he really loved the sermon. He was sitting like this. So, you know, you could tell by this body language that he was just absolutely loving the message. So uh, as he was sitting there like that, I said, okay, there's probably going to be a discussion after the sermon. And uh, there was. I was told, you know, hey, we need to see you in the office. And I said, okay. So I went to the office, and I sat down. And this is what the gentleman said to me. He said, uh, I, I understand you are teaching the congregation that they can have victory over sin before Jesus comes. I said, amen. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Yes, amen. You know, you got to smile a lot. It helps. So I said, amen, Pastor. Yes, yes. And he said, uh, you know that's not true. I said, actually, I don't know that, Pastor. What do you mean? He says, well, Romans 3.23 says, all will keep sinning and come short of the glory of God. I said, that's not the Bible I'm reading from, Pastor. He said, yeah, he says, in the original. I said, well, I'm so thankful that I have an original language tool right here. Let's look it up. And I began to look it up right there, and I said, there is nothing in the original language that says that. He said he did a doctoral dissertation proving that we cannot have victory over sin before Jesus comes. I wondered how he graduated. And he gave me his book as a gift. I said, I want you to read this. And I figured, well, I got a fireplace at my house, so, you know. So what I'm saying is, is that when, when I was given this, I marveled. I said, Pastor, you cannot be, especially a seven-day Adventist, a child of prophecy, and believe that we cannot have victory over sin. He said, why do you say that? I said, because we believe in something called the close of probation. We believe in Revelation 22 and verse 11, where the Bible says that a day shall come where Jesus is going to say, let him who is filthy be filthy still, and let him who is holy be holy still. The question is, does Jesus come after he makes that declaration? The answer is no. God's people still go through a time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, 5 through 7. It's Revelation 16. I said God's people go through that time period. So my question is this. If there's no mediator in the sanctuary anymore, and the people are still going to be sinning as you say, then that means that Matthew 1, 21 is wrong. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people 
from their sins. Really what you're saying is that they're going to call his name Jesus and he's going to save his people in their sins. And if we can be saved in sin, then Satan has every right to say, let me back in. Because that's the only reason, according to the biblical record, he got kicked out. And God is no respecter of persons. I said, so my dear friend, there's no way that you can believe what you're believing. The elders said, how can you prove that we will have victory over sin? I said, I'll prove it. I said, let's go to the book of Revelation 14. Please go there with me. The Bible makes a very powerful point in Revelation 14. I want to prove to you that there will be a people that love Jesus so much that they will die before they break his heart again. I want to prove that from the Bible. Revelation 14, notice what the Bible says. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, watch the text very carefully. In fact, I'll give you a bonus. Let's go to 1 Peter 2 first, and then we'll go to Revelation 14. Let me give you a bonus. I'm just having a little fun studying the word right now. I hope you don't mind. In 1 Peter 2, let's notice what the Bible says, talking about our lovely Savior Jesus. I want you to watch how he walked on this earth. The Bible says in 1 Peter, the second chapter. If you're there, oh, please say amen. Notice what the Bible says, 1 Peter 2. It says in 1 Peter 2, we're going to start right there at verse 19. It says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and you suffer for it and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now watch it, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us and what? Ah, don't lose that. So when Jesus lived on this earth, did he leave us an example? Yes, now watch. It says, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Now watch the next verse. Who did no sin, and neither was guile found in his mouth. Are you following? So according to the verse, the life of Jesus was a life of temptation big time. Is that right? But the Bible says he did how much? No sin and no what was found in his mouth. Oh, now watch this. Revelation 14. Now let's go there. Revelation, the 14th chapter. Revelation 14 switches from Jesus and now it switches to his people. So let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation now, the 14th chapter. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, when you get there, please say amen. Okay, so watch this one now. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, the Bible now says this, starting at verse 1. It says, and I look, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him how many people? 140 and 4,000 having the Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now watch verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Going on. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, verse 5, and in their mouth, this is talking about God's people, in their mouth was found what? No God. Does that sound like Jesus? It said in Jesus' mouth there was what? No guile. In their mouth it says there was what? No guile. Then, what else does it say? It says, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are what? Without fault. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Here goes a group of people that Christ accomplished the work. It says they are without fault. And you know why I think this is so deep? These are a people that exist before the second coming of Jesus Christ. God will have a people that love him so much and that have God's love in them so deep that no guile will be found in their mouth. The word guile means deceit. No deceit will be found in their mouths and 
they will no longer fall because Christ is the one keeping them from falling. We actually have the privilege of being counted amongst this group. Why would we shun our opportunity? Some people think you have an opportunity when you get to be a president of a school or a business. Some people think you have an opportunity when you got a number one school that's ready to bring you in as a student. Some people think you have an opportunity when you have an opportunity to be a president, even of a country or otherwise. Here goes God saying, you have an opportunity to perfectly reflect the lovely image of Jesus and light the world up with my character. What's more precious, what is more opportune than that? We have the privilege. We have the opportunity. But in order for this to take place, if we're going to have the victory over sin through the righteousness of Christ, if the love of God is going to compel us to be faithful even when we're tempted to be unfaithful, then the question is we need to make sure we do have a clear understanding of what is sin. Because it makes no sense to have the need for victory over something if we don't understand what the something is. And so very quickly, Let's go through 1 John 3 and verse 4. The Bible says in the book of 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John, the third chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says because we're talking about it. God definitely can and wants and we can and will have victory over sin through the blessed merits and righteousness of our Savior Jesus Christ. We will have it. But the Bible makes it clear that we need to understand what sin is. And so the Bible first says in 1 John 3 and verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. We must get to a place where the commandments of God can be written on our foreheads. We must get to a place that we no longer talk about Sabbath keeping when on the Sabbath we're talking about everything secular. Did you catch that? We don't want to talk about Sabbath keeping when we're really talking about everything that's secular on the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is not to find out where people got their hair done. The Sabbath is not the day to find out where you bought your car and how much you paid for it. The Sabbath is not the day to talk about everything secular that's happening on the news. The Sabbath is not the day that we're going to go ahead and talk about how we're going to plan what we're getting ready to do next week. The Sabbath is not even the day to talk about all your classes and what you've been going through in school and talking about the notes and the subjects and everything that have nothing to do with God. The Bible says, speak not thine own words on my holy day. God says, can't we talk about Jesus even for a few hours? You know, for many of us, heaven would probably be hell. Because if we say, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And when we start going down that song, but at the same time, we look back and we say, Lord, I don't even like talking about you even in the 24-hour period. And it's not even 24 hours because we're sleeping at least for eight or nine of it. For just the few hours, can we talk about the things of creation and redemption, my brothers and sisters? Have you noticed that that's hard? Have you noticed it's actually very hard? to stay focused, that we can just talk of the one whom we love. Jesus says, if you can't endure it for just a few hours, maybe it would be punishment to give you an eternity of it. You understand that? So in the mind of God, he's saying, let's learn the language of heaven. Let's learn to talk of holy things. Let's learn to talk of the things of creation, redemption, and all these wonderful things. And how much the more in British Columbia, brothers and sisters, I don't know if you're aware of it, you got some beautiful country out here. I've been waiting years to get myself out here. Because I know what I see on TV, now I said I want to touch it. I love nature, brothers and sisters. You're talking to a straight up city boy, reformed. But city boy, I grew up in the concrete jungle of New York. So I know concrete. I don't want to see no more concrete. I don't want to see another building. I've seen it for double my lifetime. I want to see nature. I want to behold the mountains that represent the majesty and power and authority of God. I want to see the waters and I want to listen to it. And then I want to imagine what Revelation means when it says the voice of Christ is like many waters. That's what I love doing. 
is sitting there and beholding nature and listening to the voice of God speak to me through his second Bible. That's what I want. So we have lots of opportunities on God's holy Sabbath day. We don't need to talk about basketball, baseball, and who won and who didn't and all this other stuff. God says, just for these few hours, can we have some unadulterated time? And again, here goes marriage as my lesson. It is amazing how there were times that I could spend time with my wife, but if I spend time with my bride, I could talk about everything that's on my mind. What's on my mind all the time? Ministry, and a lot of times, it's issues. There's a lot of issues in ministry. And I have to learn when my wife and I have our talk time, that's not my time to be like, honey, you know what's on my mind? You know what it is? I mean, I just can't imagine that. Can you imagine we try to have a board meeting today and all of a sudden, da, 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 that, that's not quality conversation. My wife is not saying, boy, do I love this conversation. She's, she's not even thinking that, I guarantee you. But finding out what's going on in her mind, finding out what is it you like, finding out, you understand? It's true communion. Some of us say we're keeping Sabbath, but we're talking about our own personal interests where God says, I'm not interested in this right now. God's trying to say, I want a more intimate communion with you right now. Let's talk about each other. Let's talk about our walk. Let's talk about what I'm doing and have done for you of how I'm going to get you to spend the rest of your eternity with me. And some of us are struggling just to do that. And so while we're getting ready to tell the world and the worldlings, sin is a transgression of the law. You need to keep the Sabbath. We have to ask ourselves, am I really a Sabbath keeper? You understand, saints? Oh, but it goes deeper than that. Go to Romans 14. In Romans 14, it gets even deeper now. Romans 14. In Romans, the 14th chapter, the Bible helps us understand some more. We're talking about what is sin. Romans, the 14th chapter. In Romans, the 14th chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says here, and it's found in verse 23. In Romans, the 14th chapter now, we're looking at the 23rd verse. Here's what the Bible also says when we're talking about what is sin, because this is the thing Jesus wants to give us victory over, and we can have it through the merits of Jesus Christ. Watch this, Romans 14. In Romans 14 and verse 23, the Bible says, and he that, what? He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There's nothing that hurts God more than when we claim promises and state beliefs that at the end of the day, we're doubting and don't really believe it. Doubt is offensive to God. It doesn't just make him uncomfortable, it's offensive. Remember what the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse six? He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Without faith, it's impossible. Imagine that we're singing a song that we're singing, God will take care of you. And in our minds, we're saying, I don't believe he will take care of me, and that's why I'm constantly stressed out over my bills and how I'm going to take care of myself. In the eyes of God, he's saying, you don't even believe the song. So the question is, did he receive the song? No, it didn't please him. Because we're singing what we don't even believe. Christ says, I want you to believe me. Jesus says, prove me. That's what I love about God. He actually says, oh, you doubt me? Prove me. He's so big and so loving and so kind that he says, if you're having a challenge, prove me. Do what I say, watch what happens. And when we do it, there's nobody who will do what God says and will come back and say with understanding, I wish I never listened to God. Brothers and sisters, doubt is sin in the eyes of God. We can get to a certain place where we begin doubting him to the point that it can become actual sin and offend him because we won't believe him and we won't do what he says because we're doubting and we're not sure he means what he says. We're insinuating you're lying. I don't trust you. And that's offensive. So God says, yes, victory over sin. So he doesn't want us to just get victory over lawlessness. He wants us to get victory over doubting. He wants to give us victory over this doubtful attitude and doubtful spirit that a lot of us carry while we're talking about finishing the work and finishing the race. But it's not just there. James 4. In James 4, notice what the Bible says here. We're talking about victory over sin. We need it. The question is how, Lord? How can we get it? So now we look at James, the fourth chapter. 
And notice what the Bible says in James 4 and verse 17. And if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in James 4 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Bible makes it clear. If we are boasting because of what we know. You ever had somebody say something and we, re we respond back, I know that. We say, I know that. The question is not what you know. The question is what are you doing about what you know? God could care. Listen, to me, it is more indictful to an individual when they boastfully say, I know, but then they're still not doing it. Because God is saying, so if you know, why aren't you doing it? Well, I can't. Wait a minute. I can do all things through Christ. And you're telling me you can't? You see, we can say to man, I can't do that because man can't really help us but so much. But when God tells us to do something, we can't say to him, Lord, I can't because God says, oh, really? You can't? How is it that you can't when I promised you that I'm going to give you the strength? How is it you can't when God says, I promised you I am the source of your power? God says there may be limits with you, but there's no limit with me. So there's a lot of us that know to do good when it comes to diet. We know what to do, but sometimes we cheat and cheat and cheat and cheat. And then when the medical time comes and we get checked out and the doctor says, I see a spot. I think we're going to have to go ahead and do some checks on you. It might be cancer. You know what a lot of us do? Lord, why did you do this to me? And God says, wait a minute. You knew. The problem is, is you didn't want to follow what you knew. And now that you're finally reaping the whirlwind of your choices, God is getting the blame? Brothers and sisters, we have to understand, if God imparts knowledge to you, and let me say something to you, Seventh-day Adventists, if ever there is a movement that will be held in high accountability, it is the Seventh-day Adventist people. We have been endowed with a degree of light that is beyond any other denominated movement on planet Earth. And God has given us much, and much will be required. And so God says, I don't want you to stay in this lifestyle of knowing and not doing. I can do. I'm so, isn't that what the Bible says? I can do all things. It didn't say, I can know all things through Christ who strength. That's not what the text says. I can do it. Jesus says, I'm holding myself accountable. Jesus says, whatever I have called you to do, I will give you power to do it. We have no reason to doubt. We have no reason to fall short. And so when we think of victory over sin, it's not enough to just think victory over lawlessness, victory over doubting, but it's victory over knowing and not doing. God wants to give us victory over that too. He wants you to live up to every ray of light and truth you know. That's all that he requires of you. Are you living what you know? You may not know everything. God says, I'll work with that. But the question is, whatever little light or great light you have, you and I must plead with God, Lord, bring me to an experience that I can live what at least I know to be right. And then he'll give you more light. He'll give you more light, saints. I used to think that this was the limitation of what the Bible defines as sin. And then one day... I don't even remember how I came across this verse. But when I read this verse, this changed a dynamic of my life forever. There's another dynamic to what the Bible calls sin that I never even thought of it until I read it. And I'm going to spend the last few moments together with you all talking about this one. 1 Samuel chapter 12. In 1 Samuel the 12th chapter, Samuel is working amongst the people of God. And there were many issues amongst the Israelites, Saul is king. And there are many challenges. But I want you to see what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 
And this thing hit me like a ton of bricks, I must confess. And it's found in verse 23. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23, it says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against who? Sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. In ceasing to pray for you. I thought to myself, wait a minute. There were many things that Israel was worthy of prayer for. Samuel understood his need to intercess on behalf of his brothers and sisters who was constantly falling in sin to the point that if he ceased to pray, to intercess for his brethren, he says, I would sin against God. And I thought to myself, I said, Lord, is praying for others that deep? I want you to think about it. How many times has somebody told you a problem that they have? And we responded by saying, I'll pray for you. And then we never once prayed for them. We forgot. We forgot. And we just kind of kept it moving. Here goes God suggesting to us through the experience of Samuel that it could be a sin against the Lord if we cease praying for others, for others, not just for yourself, but for others. I used to always hear about Martin Luther spending three hours in prayer, and I was like, how in the world does he do that? What are you asking God for? You can ask God before so much. And for many years, I could not understand that Jesus, that, uh, Luke 6 and verse 12, Jesus would spend all night in prayer. I'm like, how did you spend all night in prayer? There's but so many things to ask for. Lord, bless me, bless my family, bless my house. You know, how, well, how many things do you ask for? And it never crossed my mind. When you start learning to pray for others, you can spend many hours in prayer. And so I started to look at this thing a little bit more deeply, and I said, Lord, what are some things that could or could not happen to us if we did not pray for one another? And then look at what I found. I found this one right here. Did you know healing? How many of us, you know, when you think about people who are sick, sometimes they need healing. And when we're sick, we become very naturally selfish. You understand that? When we get sick, the whole world must circle around us because I need to get better because I'm sick. I'm so thankful that's not how medical missionary work works. That's not how our sanitariums work. Believe it or not, sanitariums, though they be few, sanitariums, when somebody got sick, we would actually help the sick person do some duty or something for somebody else. And when they would do work to help somebody else, whatever the, of course, the limitations of their disease, but they would go, if it's just pray for somebody, if it's maybe help somebody with their garden, or if it's just simply make a phone call, maybe give a Bible study, a word of encouragement, something. But when they get out of self and they begin to go ahead and help others, you would be amazed at how healing can come to them because they're helping other people. That's biblical. That's Isaiah 58, 6 through 8. If you look at Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7, serving others. Verse 8, it says, then your health shall spring forth speedily. So literally, serving others, your health springs forth speedily. So I started looking at this thing about prayer. Did you know that some of us may not be experiencing healing because, notice my word may, I want to make that very clear. I'm not putting a guarantee on any of this, but I believe assess your, yourselves. Check your lives. Find out where are the missing components. So if I'm pursuing healing, then I think this verse becomes very important to us. The Bible says in James 5 and verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Praying for others can actually benefit you. Now, brothers and sisters, in the event that there is a carnal mind in this room, this verse is not saying maintain our selfish attitudes and selfish mindsets and pray with people with the motive that you will get healed and then you'll get healed. That is not what the verse is suggesting. This is something that is being done from a heart that is sincere, genuinely concerned about others. Amen? All right, very good. We just want to make sure that God got to put that out there. Because some people start saying, man, I care all about me, but if I pray for others, maybe I'll get healing. It'll never work. 
won't get past the ceiling. You understand that? But the Bible makes that clear. There's some of us right now that maybe need healing, that are not getting healing, because maybe our lives are too self-centered. We don't take time to pray for others, genuinely, sincerely. But it's not just that. Then I thought about this one, a quiet and peaceable life. Who doesn't want that? Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says right there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 3. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for how many men? All men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Prayer for others. You see, one of the things that happens is when you and I begin to pray for others, our attitudes start changing towards others. The more that I pray for my president is the more that I will be moved with compassion toward my president. Even though he may do things worthy of correction, I'm not saying that we eliminate the need for correction when it is called for. What I'm saying is sometimes we can be a little too hard. Sometimes we can be a bit rough. But the more you pray for people, it helps maintain a compassionate attitude towards people. You know, the people of Israel sinned against God, but Jesus was still moved with compassion. Matthew 9, 36, he was still moved with compassion. And he dealt with sin, but he did it in a way that all of us would learn many, many lessons from it. Not just that, but then also, our losses can be restored. And when I say losses, I'm talking about even temporal losses. Now again, none of these things are guaranteed. I'm not, I'm not putting it out there that if you do this, this will happen. What I'm saying is, is that for many of us, this is a neglected area of our lives. And some of these things like lack of healing, not having a quiet and peaceable life, our losses are not being restored to us. Sometimes it can be because we are very selfish and self-centered people, and we don't even have time to pray for people. We are busy. God says you're hurting yourself. I'm hurting myself. There can get to a point that we can sin against the Lord because we have ceased to pray for others. And we need victory over this level of selfishness as well. And so it is, some of our losses can be restored. Look, Job 42 and verse 10. The Bible says, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. His losses were restored when he prayed for his friends. You see, you got to understand, his friends were actually his enemies. Notice what Ellen White says. She says in third Bible commentary, page 1141, paragraph 8, let us strive to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. See, the word captivity is in the King James. The New King James uses the term losses, but it was the same thing. It says, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed not only for himself, but for those who were opposing him. It says, when he felt earnestly desirous, I'm so glad for these qualified statements. Job was not praying for his friends, but in his heart really hoping that they get burnt up and disappear. Job was sincere. Notice what it says. It says, when he felt earnestly desirous that the souls that had trespassed against him might be helped, he himself received help. So just remember, God always knows a fake. If we're just going to go on our knees and pray for our enemies and this, that, and the other, but at the end of the day, we really don't care about them, we could care less what happens. If they never showed up to church again, we would not even ask where they are. God says, I know your heart. Don't ever forget 1 Samuel 16, 7. God looks on the heart. So we can't fool him. So it has to be sincere. And we can ask God, Lord, help me to be sincere. But look at what it says. It says, when he felt earnestly desirous that the souls that had trespassed against him might be helped, he himself received help. Let us pray not only for ourselves, but for those who have hurt us and are continuing to hurt us. 
Pray, pray, especially in your mind. Give not the Lord rest, for his ears are open to hear sincere, important prayers when the soul is humbled before him. Victory over sin. It's not just victory over lawlessness. It's not just victory over doubt. It's not just victory over knowing and not doing, but it's victory over selfishness and that we will begin praying and intercessing for others, even our enemies. This is an aspect of sin a lot of us don't necessarily consider, but God does. And that's why he had it recorded in Holy Writ. I want you to look at this last point here. Another thing that happens when we begin to pray for others, it testifies we are truly sons and daughters of God. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 5. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, notice what the Bible says. We're down to the close. In Matthew 5, notice what it says as we consider verse 43 to 45. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verses 43 to 45. And when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them which hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Verse 45, that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, I believe God is allowing a lot of things to happen in our world right now. I believe he's allowing things to happen in the church, and I believe he's allowing a lot of things to happen in the world. And it's very easy to choose what we hate and what we love because there's enough going on. But my brothers and my sisters, I believe with all of my heart that God is testing us through the realities of what's happening in our church and in the world at large. And the question is, how do you and I respond? Listen, saints, when apostasy comes in the ranks, we are to lift up a standard against it with pen and voice. But brothers and sisters, the greatest part of those wars will be won on our knees. We must learn to pray when there is foul leadership. We must learn to pray for those who are tearing down God's present truth. While we will have to stand at times with pen and with voice and protest against the evils that are taking place, even in the ranks of God's church. My hope and my prayer is that we will never do more standing than kneeling. We must get to that place that we learn to pray for apostates. We must learn to pray and intercess and plead that God will intervene when we see the evil processes taking place. I believe right now God is allowing things to happen to help our characters really come out. Because there's more than enough sides to pick in the movement. Is that right? You can pick whatever side. You got precious truth, you got present truth. You got liberal and you got conservative. You got all sorts of classes in the movement, but then there's the people that just want to be like Jesus. I say like Jesus, you know why? My brothers and my sisters, one day Jesus went on that cross. He was God. My mind can't wrap this thing. He was God. And he went on the cross and even on the cross, people were mocking him. Most of his disciples abandoned him. And people have beat him and bruised him. And these are all people that he came to die for and to serve. And here goes Jesus doing something so unlike human nature. He says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. He's still interceding. Even on Calvary, he's still interceding. He ascends into the sanctuary, and he's our priest that ever liveth to intercede for us. 
Wicked, wretched, miserable, poor, blind sinners like us. And he's still interceding. He's still saying, Father, please, just a little bit more mercy. A little bit more mercy. One day, by my grace, they'll wake up. And we think that somebody hurts us a couple of times, three times, four times. You hurt me the fifth time. Oh, you hurt me the seventh time. Seven is the per perfect number, bro. You hurt me the seventh time. I'm going to stop praying for you, and I'm going to pray that fire rains on you. Jesus says even 70 times seven. My brothers and my sisters, we can get to a place that we can sin by ceasing to pray for others. We can get to that place. And I want you to search your heart. As God helped me, this is what kept me up last night. I said, Lord, this is incredible. I said, I did not understand it like this. And it's pushing me and encouraging me more and still more that Dwayne slow down just a bit on some of that study time and increase quite a bit on some kneeling prayer time for others. For others. You see, it is true. Sin separates us from God. But I'm so thankful for Calvary because as a result of Calvary, bridges the gap, it brings us into union with him. And I'm thankful that the Bible says, that having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, it didn't stop at Calvary. Jesus is not on the cross anymore, but the blood of the cross is in the most holy place. And in that sanctuary above where Christ wants to cleanse us from how much? All sin, including the subjects we study today. We are told having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. My brothers and sisters, there is a need for victory over sin, a need. It's the only way the pain stops, yours and God's. It's the only way the joy stops, Satan's. And Jesus has offered everything to us that this theory can become our reality. But you've got to be willing to draw near. You got to be willing to cooperate. You got to believe that he can literally deliver you from lawlessness, from doubting, from knowing but not doing, and from ceasing to pray for those who deserve and need your prayers. God can give you victory. So if you know that you're in the same trap that I'm in, and you know there's no way out except Jesus deliver me, and you are willing to cooperate better with God. Listen to me, saints. Listen, some of us are not going to do this, maybe. But I am here to let you know the blessing is in the doing. If you know I'm frustrated in the gospel, there are areas when it comes to God's commandments, I'm violating. There are areas where I know to do right, and I keep playing with God's grace, and I keep making it cheap. If you know I'm a doubtful Thomas, it seems like I don't believe anything God has promised. If you know I am absolutely selfish, and I'm busy, and I don't take time to even pray for anybody else, let alone myself. And you're saying, I need Jesus to come into my heart and to give me real victory, that I may cooperate with him and experience the great need of heaven, which is victory over all sin. If that is your covenant you are willing to make with God, let's do it on our feet together, please. You're standing because you recognize the falling short but how God can keep you from falling. And there might be one of us in this room that says, you know what, uh, I have never given my heart to Jesus. I've never surrendered my life to him. I come and visit the church, but I am not truly a member. I have not surrendered my heart to Christ. I am not a Christian. But I'm willing to give Jesus a try. Remember, he said, prove me. Maybe there's somebody in this room that's never proven Christ. Maybe you've never given him a chance. 
And Jesus says, listen, you can't deliver yourself from sin. But Jesus says, but I can. That's why I came. And if there's even one person under the sound of my voice, whether youth or adult, and you are saying, that's me. I have not surrendered my life to the Lord, but I see that I need this man of Calvary that is able to give me victory, not over some and not over most, but all of my sins that so easily beset me. And if it's your desire to surrender your life to this Jesus today, then I just want you to slip your hand up in the air because I want to pray for you. Would there be one that says, yep, that's me. I've never given my heart to the Lord. God bless you. God bless you in the back. God bless you, brother. Amen. God bless you. Would there be another who says, yes, that's me? It's decision time, brothers and sisters. It's decision time. Time is almost finished. And I thank God that he gave us an opportunity today to get it right with him. Would there be another who says, yes, that's me. I've never given my heart to Jesus, but I'm willing to do it today. Would there be another? I just don't want to pass you by. Amen. For those who did raise your hand, I'm going to ask at the conclusion of the service, if you can please meet me up front to my right. We just want to follow up with you to help you in your journey, because it's a journey ahead. But thank God we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us all pray together as we commit ourselves afresh into the hands of God. Our loving Father, we are so grateful. We thank you, Lord, for the way your spirit has spoken to our hearts today. We thank you that victory over sin is possible it is necessary, and prophetically, it shall be fulfilled. Lord, we just simply want to be counted amongst the number. And now that you have helped us to see what sin is more clearly, sin is lawlessness. Sin is doubting you. Sin, dear God, is knowing but not doing what you've told us to do that is good. And sin is being consumed with selfishness that we cease to even pray for those who deserve and need our prayers. Lord, I pray. Help us to experience true victory. Help us to make practical covenants that we will take time to pray with and for others. And may we experience the blessings of heaven. And we praise you and thank you for what you have taught us today. Truly let not our will, but yours be done. Is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.